Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to another talk as part of the Biotech Research Club seminar series. Um, today, with, we have with us Professor Ninita A.J., uh, who is a new member of the IIT Madras faculty. Uh, Dr. Ninita completed her veterinary science degree from Madras Veterinary College, Chennai. She got a PhD from Michigan State University, where she was mentored by Professor Gregory D. Fink, an expert in cardiovascular and neuroscience research. For her postdoctoral training, she moved to University of Minnesota, where she studied the role of renal nerves in metabolic syndrome development, and also studied the role of spinal cord stimulation in altering blood pressure regulation in human hypertensives. Later, she joined IISC Bangalore as an Inspire faculty and used whole body knockout and knock in mouse models to study cardiac hypertrophy and diabetes development. She's now an assistant professor at the Department of Biotechnology, IIT Madras. Today, Ma'am will be talking about brain eicosanoids and blood pressure regulation in hypertensive rats. Uh, I kindly request everyone to turn off their videos and mics during the talk unless you have a question. Uh, feel free to type in questions into the chat box as well. Over to you, Ma'am. Thank you so much for a very nice introduction. And uh, welcome, everyone, um, for this talk. Uh, yeah, feel free to ask questions. Uh, stop me in the middle of the presentation. So and I would like to thank the Biotech Research Club for inviting me. Today, I'm going to uh, briefly present uh, some of the work that I've done in the past. Uh, and the title is The Brain Icosinoids and Blood Pressure Regulation in Hypertensive Rats. Before I start, I would like to start with the acknowledgments. Um, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Pink's laboratory at Michigan State University, uh, where I did my PhD, and Dr. Osborne's laboratory, uh, where I did my postdoc at the University of Minnesota. Then I moved on to uh, the Indian Institute of Science uh, to do uh, my uh, training as an inspired faculty. And Dr. Ravi Sundaresan was my collaborator there. So I was fortunate to work with him. And I would like to thank the Department of Biotechnology uh, for accepting me here. And I'm really glad to be here. So work as a scientist doesn't uh, get completed if you don't have good collaborations. So here are list of my collaborators from uh, my past and my present. And uh, obviously, I would like to thank the funding source as well uh, in the past as well as uh, the current funding. Just a brief introduction on what hypertension is. Hypertension or high blood pressure is the pressure exerted against the walls of the arteries. If you can see in here, the uh, crest and the trough represents the systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So the pressure exerted against the walls of the arteries, uh, when the heart uh, pumps blood out, that is systolic blood pressure, and the pressure exerted in between the two heartbeats is diastolic blood pressure. So when the pressure goes above 130 over 80, a person is diagnosed to have hypertension. And around 30% of Indian adults are found to be hypertensives, which predisposes them to various cardiovascular diseases like stroke, heart failure, heart attack, or kidney diseases. And it's predicted uh, that by 2020, both men and women have, will have an increase in a population with hypertension. Genetic factors, age, sex of an individual, stress, obesity, lack of exercise, and increase in salt sensitivity can be uh, seen as the various risk factors for a person to have hypertension. Few of these mechanisms that get affected by these risk factors include renin angiotensin system, which is basically the effect of this peptide angiotensin 2 to act on the receptors and therefore cause an increase in blood pressure. Angiotensin 2 is synthesized in your body when angiotensinogen from the liver gets converted into angiotensin 1 by the help of this enzyme renin from the kidneys and then the angiotensin converting enzymes from the lungs convert angiotensin 1 to 2. So this renin angiotensin system along with an increase in sympathetic nerve activity 
can lead to hypertension. So what do I mean by increasing sympathetic nerve activity? So there are sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves in your body. And when the sympathetic nerves fire, they release neurotransmitters like norepinephrine. What they do is they constrict the blood vessels and that can increase your blood pressure. So increased sympathetic nerve activity can lead to a person having hypertension. It's reported that around 50% of the people with essential hypertension possibly have sympathetic activation. So in order to uh, do my studies, I used the angel tensin salt hypertension model. Why did I choose this model? There are reports that when angiotensin 2, in the presence of high salt diet, in this uh, spray dolly rat, can lead to release of substances and firing of neurons, thereby increasing sympathetic nerve activity and consequently an increase in blood pressure. So how does one know there is, that there is an increase in nerve activity? There is a way called norepinephrine spillover study. So it was reported by King et al. that in the angiotensin salt rat model, there was an increase in whole body norepinephrine spilled over from the nerve terminals. So more the norepinephrine, more the sympathetic nerve firing. It was also found that there is an increase in splanchnic vascular resistance, which causes an increase in blood pressure. What do I mean by splanchnic vascular resistance? So resistance or hindrance to the flow will tend to be caused by the constriction of blood vessels. When the blood vessels constrict, the pressure will go up. So in addition to these two evidences, there were evidences that when you take out the celiac ganglia, which is like a mediator to the nerves firing, uh, it, removing the celiac ganglia by the process called celiac ganglionectomy also lowered blood pressure. Further, the nerves going to your gut, which means your stomach, your intestine, and your other organs, uh, the increase in the nerve activity to these regions called splanchnic nerves can be mediated by prostaglandins. Now I'm introducing to you the term prostaglandin. Um, if you could remember or recollect, prostaglandins are one of the causes for your fever to go up. So you take the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs um, and you bring the uh, fever down. So one of the roles of prostaglandin is that. The role that I am interested in is to see if prostaglandin play a role in blood pressure regulation. Another evidence that led me uh, to investigate further was that brain prostaglandin E2 infusion increased this splenic sympathetic nerve activity. So the nerves going to the spleen when somebody measured it, uh, so Catafucci et al. measured the splenic nerve activity and they saw that infusing prostaglandin E2 increased the splenic sympathetic nerve activity. Also, let me briefly uh, walk you through the pathway of how prostaglandins are synthesized in your body. So there are membrane phospholipids, which when acted by the enzyme called phospholipase A2, get converted into arachidonic acid. And the enzyme cyclooxygenase 1, which is a constitutively active one, and cyclooxygenase 2, which is an inducible enzyme, when they act on arachidonic acid, they convert it into prostaglandin H2. Later, different enzymes convert this prostaglandin H2 into various prostaglandins having varied roles. Some of them are vasoconstrictors. Some of them are vasodilators, which means they dilate the blood vessels. So if you constrict the blood vessels, the pressure is going to go up. If you dilate the blood vessels, the pressure will go down. At the same time, they have very various other roles as well. So all these prostaglandins, as well as thromboxins collectively, are called eicosanoids. 
these act on their receptors which are g protein coupled receptors as shown here so prostaglandin e2 will act on the ep4 receptors ep2 receptors prostaglandin i2 will act on ip receptors prostaglandin d2 will act on dp1 and dp2 receptors and similarly the thromboxanes as well now the preliminary data that i had to uh, come up with a hypothesis was this we performed studies where we measured blood pressure from a rat which was made hypertensive by giving angiotensin 2 so days are on the x axis here and the measured mean arterial pressure or blood pressure is on the y axis okay we had two groups of animals the two groups of rats one of them in open squares got dmso which was the vehicle control the closed squares are the sc560 or cyclooxygenase one inhibitor uh, treated animals so firstly we measured blood pressure in control animals which means we did not give any drug and they were with normal blood pressure so we saw that there was a pressure of around 105 mm mercury which was normal which is normal for a rat when we gave the drug sc560 which inhibited cyclooxygenase 1 we found that the blood pressure remained pretty consistent between the group and it did not increase or decrease suggesting that cyclooxygenase 1 inhibition by itself does not affect blood pressure now we gave angiotensin 2 with the help of a device like a pump it is an osmotic pump which we filled in with the uh, peptide angiotensin 2 and we surgically implanted this pump so that it slowly releases angiotensin 2 in the body of the rat now you can see in the open squares where the animals were getting control vehicle angiotensin 2 was able to increase blood pressure to around 138 mm mercury now the group which received cyclooxygenase 1 inhibitor showed an attenuated blood pressure response so this piece of data suggested that cyclooxygenase 1 may be responsible for causing increased blood pressure in animals which had angiotensin 2 infusion i'll also note that these animals were on a high salt diet which is 2% sodium chloride throughout this experiment now i mentioned to you that we are interested in the sympathetic nerve activity component so brain is the organ which is responsible for generating these uh, nerve activity responses so, or controlling them the nucleus of the brain where what was interest of to us was organum vasculoso lamina terminalis or ovlt subfonical organ or sfo paraventricular nucleus or pvn and rostral ventrolateral medulla or rvlm the reason why we chose this cardio regulatory region was brain has a blood brain barrier so component like angiotensin 2 that is being infused to these rats subcutaneously will not be able to cross the blood brain barrier so if we are thinking that it is crossing the blood brain barrier we were very much interested in the window to a blood brain barrier which are these circumventricular organs called the ovlt and sfo once angiotensin 2 can cross that it can then go and act on other areas like pvn and rvlm in the brain stem now one more observation that we found was we performed a, a array where the organum vasculoso lamina terminalis showed that one of the prostaglandin enzymes prostaglandin d synthase had an increased mrna expression so we had all the listed enzymes here and only prostaglandin d synthase 
uh, mRNA expression was higher. The receptor expression for prostaglandin D was lower. You can see the yellow region here, right? That is the choroid plexus. That is where you have SFO and OVLT located. The choroid plexus uh, contains the cerebrospinal fluid, which is the fluid which helps uh, as a shock absorber in your brain as well as the spinal cord. So the choroid plexus which lines this uh, area, we took the choroid plexus and we performed western blotting and we found that the enzyme lipocalin prostaglandin D synthase whose mRNA expression was higher uh, in the brain regions, the protein levels were higher in choroid plexus. So this evidence that the mRNA and protein levels of these enzymes are affected in angiotensin 2 salt hypertensive rats led us to our hypothesis. So we hypothesized that in a rat which is getting angiotensin 2 subcutaneously in the presence of a high salt diet will have an uh, increase in LPGDS enzyme activity and signaling through its product prostaglandin D2 and the receptor DP1 receptor could increase sympathetic nerve activity and blood pressure in this rat model of angiotensin 2 salt hypertension. To test this hypothesis, we performed an experiment. Here you can see the days. Uh, this is the sprig dolly rat males that we took. The male rats were around 200 to 250 grams. They were fed a high salt, which means around 2% sodium chloride diet throughout the study. We acclimatized the animals to a high salt diet for around seven days. This was followed by surgical implantation of a device called telemetry. Now, when the device is implanted, the animal will sit on top of a such kind of a receiver where the device will talk to the receiver and then send signals. So we will be able to measure blood pressure. After recovery from the surgery, we started to measure the controlled blood pressure, after which the drug to block the enzyme lipocalin prostaglandin D synthase called AT56 was infused intracerebroventricularly. What do I mean by that? So we used a brain infusion kit like this shown in this diagram. So it has like a needle. It has a connector which goes and connects to this osmotic pump. Okay. Now we will surgically implant this needle to the brain area using a stereotaxic apparatus. Now it will be placed in such a way that you remember the picture where I showed you the yellow area. That's where the cerebrospinal fluid is. That's where the needle will go up to. So it will be placed in the left lateral ventricles. It will circulate the uh, inhibitor throughout. And this will be done surgically. This is the pump which will be filled with the uh, drug of choice. In this case, AT56, which is an enzyme inhibitor. Now we will record the blood pressure with just the infusion of this drug. Then we will make the animal hypertensive by giving angiotensin 2, which I mentioned we will give through uh, implanting a mini osmotic pump, which will be filled with angiotensin 2 and surgically implanted uh, subcutaneously. So this animal is basically getting three surgeries for us to perform this whole experiment. So we'll be very careful on maintaining the animal's body temperature, health condition, giving proper food, monitoring it constantly, and uh, letting it have a good recovery period after each surgery. Uh, finally, I'll also uh, point to you uh, the use of a drug called hexamethonine. I mentioned to you that uh, there is a ganglia, sympathetic ganglia, right? So hexamethonium, what it does is, when I inject it intraperitoneally, it is going to block the ganglia. So therefore, if you block a ganglia, 
you will block the nerves from firing. So increased sympathetic nerve activity is found proportional to the increase in blood pressure. If you block the ganglia, you will find that the pressure should decrease. If the nerve firing causes an increase in 40 millimeter mercury pressure, and if you block the nerves from firing, there will be a drop of 40 millimeter mercury pressure. That's what we are testing with hexamethonium. Now let's look at the data. Uh, before I move to the data, I'll just show you, here is the uh, femoral artery catheterization process, the surgery where we put in a device called telemeter. This is the body of the telemeter, which is implanted into the abdominal area. This is the catheter, which goes into the femoral artery. Uh, the animal are kept for seven days to recover before we even start to measure the pressure. These mice, uh, these rats are kept on top of a receiver and here is a unit which compiles the data and we collect it on a computer. Now what we found was, uh, here are the days on the x-axis and mean arterial pressure again on the y-axis. We had two groups, one which received the vehicle and angiotensin 2 and another group which received the prostaglandin D synthase inhibitor 8056 and given angiotensin 2. The control uh, period, both the groups had similar blood pressures and 8056 by itself or the vehicle by itself did not affect pressure. Angiotensin 2 caused an increase in pressure and we found that blocking prostaglandin D synthase was able to attenuate this increase in uh, pressure, suggesting that prostaglandin uh, D synthase mediated activity, maybe by the synthesis of prostaglandins, is responsible for increasing blood pressure in general. That is our conclusion from this study. I told you that we are interested to see if sympathetic nerve activity causes an increase in pressure, right? So in these animals, which were treated with 8056, we looked at change in mean arterial pressure after injecting hexamethonium. So hexamethonium is a ganglionic blocker. If you block sympathetic nerve activity, I told you, we will be expecting to see a drop in pressure. The control animals had a drop in pressure of around 60 millimeter mercury. However, the animals which were getting prostaglandin D synthase blocker, they had only around 40 millimeter drop in mercury pressure which suggests that this uh, residual 20 millimeter mercury pressure was because prostaglandin caused increase in sympathetic nerve activity, which contributed to 20 millimeter increase in pressure in H2 salt hypertensive rats. Hopefully that makes sense. So it is a proportionality between sympathetic nerve activity and increase in pressure. If you're already blocking an enzyme and you see the drop decreases, which means the residual amount was caused by that particular uh, product, which in this case is whatever prostaglandin D synthase is synthesizing. So this suggested that the enzyme is required for increasing sympathetic nerve activity and thereby increasing pressure in this rat model. Now we perform another set of experiments where we wanted to measure the product itself. So what is the product of lipocalin prostaglandin D synthase? It converts prostaglandin H2 to D2. So in order to measure D2 in cerebrospinal fluid, choroid plexus, and various other brain regions, we performed the same study, okay? Where uh, we had the animals on a high soil diet, implanted telemetry to measure blood pressure, then recorded the pressure, made them hypertensive by angiotensin 2 infusion, and collected the tissues. But note that we collected the tissues on day 4 of angiotensin 2 treatment because we had this idea that there is an increase in one of these prostaglandins at the early stages, which is responsible for increasing sympathetic nerve activity. So the neurogenic part is early on, 
and the vascular response is later on. We collected the brain tissue, we sectioned it using a cryostat and we punched out the different brain areas and we homogenized the tissues and uh, treated it in such a way that we can perform liquid chromatography coupled with tandem mass spectrometry. So this is the LC-MS-MS uh, device. What it does is it uses your sample. It uh, kind of makes it, uh, it actually measures the uh, mass to charge ratio. So if you think about the paint spray, right? Um, it just makes uh, small droplets uh, and similarly your compound will be made into small droplets or ions and those ions will be then measured and the mass to charge ratio will give you an idea of which compound it is and in this case we measured prostaglandin d2 what we found was in the cerebrospinal fluid and choroid plexus along with the rostral ventrolateral medulla the product prostaglandin d2 was significantly higher in the rats treated with angiotensin 2. So the hypertensive rats had an increased prostaglandin D2 product. Now, product is high, but this prostaglandin D2, does it bind to a receptor? So that was our next question. We did find that DP1 receptors, uh, they are expressed in choroid plexus. You can see here, this is a DP1 receptor's negative control. And this is the positive control. The red is the DP1 receptors. Um, we find it in choroid plexus. Similarly, we wanted to look at the receptor expression in other brain regions. The green shown here is the neuronal staining through nu N, and the red is DP1 receptors. We found that in subfornical organ paraventricular nucleus and organum vasculosolamina terminalis, there was no expression of DP1 receptors. So even if prostaglandin D2 is high, it cannot bind to anything in these uh, particular cardioregulatory brain regions. What about RVLM? We found that compared to the vehicle treated animals where they, there is neuronal staining, and there is expression of DP1 receptors. You can see it as slight red colors on the neurons. When you merge the nu N and DP1 receptors, it's shown here. So compared to the vehicles, the angiotensin II treated rats had a decreased expression of the DP1 receptors. So here is what I want to point out that whenever there is an increase in the enzyme, it can lead to an increase in product as we saw. Increase in lipocalin prostaglandin D synthase caused an increase in the product prostaglandin D2. But increase in the product can sometimes, at least initially, will lead to a decrease in the receptor expression because there is enough product already available and if the signal is not required by the body to go on, there will be a quick response of a decrease in receptor expression. We believe that is what we are seeing here. Angiotensin uh, treated hypertensive rat showed a decreased expression of DP1 receptors. Now, we performed a final set of studies, uh, which I'm introducing to you here. In animals uh, which were given a salt uh, and implanted with uh, the similar intracerebroventricular pump in the lateral ventricles of your brain, of the rat's brain, uh, we gave AT56, which is LPGDS inhibitor, at three different doses. We wanted to find out whether there is a set of uh, dose for this drug to be effective and whether that particular dose is also able to change the prostaglandin D2 product levels in these specific brain areas. So we collected the brain tissue on day four uh, of these uh, hypertensive rats, which were treated with three different doses of uh, enzyme inhibitor. We did some Western blotting here, and the data is shown with 
vehicle treated animals control animals hypertensive rats and the rats which were given a low dose medium dose and a high dose of 8056 which is a lipocalin prostaglandin d synthase inhibitor so the lipocalin prostaglandin d synthase enzyme uh, was highly expressed in hypertensive animals and this is choroid plexus um the expression in the choroid plexus went down with medium and high dose uh, of the drug as shown here the enzyme expression was affected when medium and high dose of the drug was given when we looked at the prostaglandin d2 product levels in rostral ventrolateral medulla we saw a similar trend angiotensin 2 which caused hypertension caused an increase in the product prostaglandin d2 the low dose was not able to lower the product but the medium and high dose which were effective in lowering the enzyme levels in choroid plexus were able to lower the product levels in rvln suggesting that there is a dose response relationship and what we are seeing here uh is because of an effect on the enzyme as well as the product now to summarize the whole uh talk uh what we observed was angiotensin 2 in the presence of a high salt in the diet could lead to increase in the enzyme expression and activity which means production of prostaglandin d2 which could possibly act through the receptor dp1 and cause changes in sympathetic nerve activity and blood pressure so in future we may also look at dp2 receptors because we have not explored it yet and there is uh, not much data regarding its role in blood pressure regulation or sympathetic nerve activity so that's something we can look into let me also summarize it uh, like in a whole animal perspective in an rat in a rat uh, which is getting high salt in the diet angiotensin 2 can bind to the at1 receptors here is a brain and the, these are the choroid plexus and the yellow is the cerebrospinal fluid so binding of angiotensin 2 to at1 its angiotensin receptor could lead to increase phospholipase A2 activity which converts phospholipids into arachidonic acid cyclooxygenase 1 converts arachidonic acid to prostaglandin H2 prostaglandin H2 is converted to prostaglandin D2 by this enzyme LPGDS prostaglandin D2 uh, which is which we measured in choroid plexus CSF cerebrospinal fluid and RVLM rostral ventrolateral medulla could act on the receptors found in choroid plexus and rvlm and this can through the spinal cord through the sympathetic change through the celiac ganglia uh, affect the blood vessels in your uh, gut increase the resistance decrease the capacitance and increase the blood pressure the evidence of which other investigators have found in this rat model so in conclusion prostaglandin d2 signaling in the brain is possibly very critical for the development of neurogenic angiotensin 2 salt hypertension and since human patients also have neurogenic hypertension as i mentioned in my uh, initial slides uh, this is something of interest which we can look into so with this i would thank everyone who is here um, and i'll be happy to answer your questions thank you Hi Ninita Amal here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Yeah. Nice work, nice uh, presentation. Uh, I mm -hmm. have one question. Yes. What is the uh, role of salt here exactly? Does salt, high salt intake, increase the angiotensin 2 uh, level? Uh, actually, we gave animals one uh, percent, two percent, and four percent salt. Um, it does not directly increase the angiotensin 2 levels but it is seen to affect the sympathetic nerve activity so uh it doesn't 
have a effect on the hormone but on the nerve activity which results in blood pressure to go up so it's interesting how in mice just angiotensin 2 is given and still you can work with that model of hypertension but it's not neurogenic it's mostly vascular but when you want to look at the neurogenic hypertension you usually combine these two and that's what we used okay and uh, in uh, human patient uh, what is the uh, kind of uh, is this is this hold true in uh, human patient also it will hold true in part of the human population as i mentioned only 50% of the people are shown to have an increase in sympathetic nerve activity that's because maybe they are salt sensitive uh, they have yeah sometimes some people can actually feel more salt in your food than some people who maybe like uh, require less salt so there is a salt sensitivity sensitivity present so it's not for the whole population it's for a subset of the population. and those patient do you know whether they have increased heart rate also because if your sympathetic discharge increases it is going to increase the heart rate also they have uh, tachycardia uh actually we did not uh, see any uh, change in heart rate in these rats at least in human patients uh, if it is reported i am not aware of that yeah in these rats we measured heart rate uh, it was not very different uh, between the hypertensive and the control groups mm -hmm. yeah so my point is that if it is mediated through the synap uh, your sympathetic nervous system that then, then uh, you expect the heart rate to be increased isn't it okay 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 that's that is the question okay uh, the only evidence that i have for uh, sympathetic nerve activity to be involved is we measured a uh, global norepinephrine content and we okay. found hypertensive rats to have more so that was like an indirect measure and there are also studies where direct nerve recordings were done and only splanchnic nerve activity was higher and the other nerve activities were lower uh, like the renal was lower there was no change in lumbar so i i agree with your point it might not be a global change in sympathetic nerve activity but only like what is called a sympathetic signature to one region okay yeah thank you yeah nice. yeah thank you